Welcome to Martin Survival. In our part one series of finding water in the desert, we came to this exact location to look for signs of water. We looked for vegetation, we dug underneath the soil, and finally we found a very small pocket of water. In today's video, I'm gonna search a little farther back into this canyon and uh, we'll see if we can't find any more trails or signs. So stay with me and let's start our search once again. So what I'm going to do is head farther up this dry wash and instead of stopping where I did last time at that dead end, I'm actually going to scale up and over the exposed bedrock. See when you find exposed bedrock in the desert when in search for water, it's extremely important to check some of that area out. The reasoning being is during monsoon months we'll have a lot of water that's raging through that area but once that water's all gone it'll leave behind little pockets and crevices of water that's naturally shaded thus protecting itself against the harsh sunlight during these later months of the year. So let's go ahead and head farther up this wash. I'll take you guys back to that same mortar hole we found water at last time. We'll see if some is there. If not, we'll continue our search. So let's get going. Those of you who've seen part one of this series should recognize this. This is that same exact mortar hole I found water in last time. However, it's completely dried up right now. Monsoon season's completely over. It's long gone. But as you can see, this is very smooth inside. So most likely this was processed with foods such as mesquite, uh, Joshua tree fruit seeds, yucca fruit seeds, uh, cat claw acacia, palo verde, so forth and so on. Um, this is very, very interesting and most likely made by either Serrano or Chemawavy. You know, at one time in history, I do believe that this area that I'm standing on today was a river. And the reason I say that is due to the fact wherever there was water and abundance of water, early man would follow and live right around that area due to the resources they would have available. Right behind me, we have petroglyphs and artifacts. In front of me, we have petroglyphs. Up top, we have petroglyphs. And even farther down this dry wash, we have petroglyphs and artifacts. So these are all signs of early man. And the reason I say early man is I do recognize one. The one is an atlatl. And the atlatl came far before the longbow. So this was very early man that lived off of this land and when it started getting colder, they would start migrating down into the Colorado River and the Coachella Valley. So these are very, very interesting markings. And uh, this shows me that this was very rich in resources. Well, as you can see, we reached a dead end. So at this point, I need to scale up and over this exposed bedrock and follow this bend around to continue my search. Before I head up this bedrock, I wanna show you what we have here. We have a little bit of water, just a small seep. And at one time, this was trickling down. You can see some of the mineral from the water. But unfortunately, at this current time, I cannot collect this. I tried tracing it underneath this boulder. I even tried tracing it back in this covey. Can't find any pools, no pockets. Uh, so this is kind of disappointing. I can't get my canteen under there. There's nothing I can see to throw my aquarium tubing back. So we'll just have to move farther up and see what we can't find. As you can see, down there is where I came. And I'm just heading up. All this exposed bedrock is where I want to start my search. Some of these natural pockets will contain water from monsoon season. But like I said, monsoon season is far over. So I might not even find water. There is no guarantee out here. There just is not. But you can see how smooth this is. All that is nice and smooth. And those are perfect areas to search for water. So got a lot of thick grasses down here. When this flooded, it was raging. And now I need to get up over this, so I'll be back with you guys in just a bit. 
up and over and we continue on so even up here you can see where water settled that one time <clears throat> This is a good find. This right here is Palo Verde. These seeds are very, very good for you. It is a, uh, <clears throat> it is an excellent food. The Serrano, the Cuya, and the Chemuevi would rely upon this during certain seasons of the year. All right, so down in here, I just followed that wash bed up and you can see what we have here. In this exposed bedrock, we have lots of natural pockets. This is all smooth. Water was raging through here. So this is an area where we would really wanna stay clear of unless we're dipping down in here to collect water. We would not wanna make our base camp here. I mean, this water was I mean, it was really, really ripping through here. So we want to be very careful. What I'm going to do is I always carry my canteen and I also carry a nesting cup. Both are stainless steel. So I'm going to collect this water and I'm going to take it back down and we're going to disinfect it. So there is some insects in here. That's a good sign. If there wasn't, I would want to be very careful and I would probably want to steer clear from this. And that's right out about up to the top. So we'll take this down and this thing right here is a good 40 ounces. The good thing is, is there is still a lot of water down in this pocket. So we can keep coming back to this location to collect more and stay hydrated throughout the day. Now, as mentioned earlier, I am going to boil this water to disinfect it. And that's really my first go-to compared to chemicals. I don't really like putting chemicals into my body. And not only that, certain chemicals do not work with cryptosporidium. And I, once again, I do not know what's in that water. It was found in the wild. So I wanna make sure it's really disinfected by boiling. Now, boiling will get rid of cryptosporidium. However, with that being said, there is a downfall with boiling. It takes a lot of firewood, a lot of hydration, a lot of calories. I have to process the wood. I have to gather and haul the wood back to my base camp. But once I have that set, I'm good to go. As long as I have plenty of firewood, I can stay warm at night, that's most important. I can cook my food and disinfect the water, plus keep the animals and critters away. I could even make tools. So what I'm going to do to make this fire is use a method called the hand drill. You guys have seen this before. This is my hand drill kit and I've really made a certain connection with this kit. And that goes along with any kit that I create. 
you have to have that connection. It really brings you closer to the earth and what she provides. So I just got my, uh, my hole already burned in here. I'm gonna add saliva and create my ember. And I'm starting off slow because this is cold. This hand drill kit was left overnight and I wanna get it nice and warm. So I just start off slow and I work up speed. So I'm starting to see a little bit of smoke. Now one thing I really don't mention in some of my other videos with the hand drill or the bow drill, any primitive fire, is you know once you have an ember it does not mean you have fire so you got to really take your time you bought you got to have a level head got to be cool and collective need a little bit more spit Not quite yet, getting close, that's all right. It does take time and I have failed at this over and over again. But once again, practice makes perfect. Primitive skills is definitely a lifetime of learning. See what we got. And this time we do have a nice hot ember. And I'll set my hand drill kit to the side, up off the cold ground. And I'm gonna transfer this ember into my tinder bundle. At this point, I can relax a little bit and I can now blow this into flame. My tinder bundle is juniper bark. Juniper bark, cottonwood is really what's available. Sometimes you'll run into Mojave yuccas out here.
and we have fire. So at this point, I'm going to slowly add my fuel. and get my fire going. And I did bring a friend out here. You guys might know him. Very good friend of mine. Helps teach some of our classes here. Take a seat, dude. All right. Uh, I'll get down, I won't be able to get back up. <laughs> Mr. Howdy. Dude McLean. <laughs> How you doing, dude? I'm doing good today. Thank you. fire nice and strong yeah looking good yeah when I create primitive fire one thing I like to do is uh, usually I'll wear a cotton bandana across my forehead I'll take the hat completely off and just wrap it around my forehead and there's a reason for that it uh, it catches the sweat that's the one thing you do not want to drop on that ember, and I see that happen very, very often, is folks will get in the hype of creating fire and their adrenaline's really going and they're really working hard, and that sweat will put that ember out. Or it'll touch that hole and guess what? They have to make a new one. How many times have you seen that? Dozens. <laughs> Lots yeah. of times, Dozens. huh? That's right. Yeah. The slightest little thing can throw you off. That's right. really dance in there. And now I'm adding larger, heavier material. It's getting that fire built up. Yeah, it's one of the things you have to be careful of. Sometimes people get too much in a hurry and they're trying, they're getting too much on and they cut off the oxygen flow. That's right. If it gets too heavy too fast, you're in trouble. Yeah. And one thing is the wind. Whenever there's high winds, which the West Coast usually gets, very rarely we have a calm day like this. When there's high winds, plan on gathering twice the firewood. It'll burn up like It'll crazy. It'll burn up like crazy, that's right. And we'll just let that burn for a little bit. Yeah, that breeze helps out a little bit. Yep, it 
just barely there too. Yeah. I'm gonna get more wood from that bundle. Always, always, always carry black trash bags. It can be used for shelter, be used for a poncho, which runs along the same lines of shelter. You can use as a rain catch. But one of the best things that I have used this for is gathering firewood. Now a lot of this stuff is just processed, but I have been out there and I'm sure dude has many times where he has gathered plenty of firewood using these black trash bags. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the handiest things to have around. That's right. This is the one piece of gear that I do not leave without. Whether it's in my vehicle kit, if it's in my scouting pack, a three-day pack, and I'll carry multiple trash bags. It makes a great room too if you need it. That's right. All right, so at this point, I'm just going to remove the lid off of my bottle and I'm gonna place this directly in the fire. I want this sitting flat so it doesn't spill over. So I'll just slide that in right there. And we'll wait, let this get to uh, about 212 degrees, that's boiling point, and we'll be good to drink it. All right, so we are now at boiling point. This has a nice roaring boil on it this water is now disinfected. So what I do is I use a pair of tongs. You can make these or just use pieces of wood like this to carefully remove the fire. And this is important, you do this slow. You don't wanna risk burning yourself. So what I'll do is I'll just grasp it together and slowly move it out of the fire. Just like that. I'll move back. Okay, so once we have this moved out of the fire, we need to start doing the cooling process. So this is gonna take a while to cool. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll dig a pit and I'll, I'll place the water bottle in that cool ground to where it's going to uh, I'm getting a face full of smoke <laughs> to where it's going to start cooling twice as fast. I'll even line it with vegetation and uh, that helps out quite a bit too. But in this case, we'll just pick this up and we'll slide it over and just let the convective breeze cool this bottle. Well, what I did is I actually came around this bend and uh, you can see that we have a microclimate of shade. That helped the cooling process with this water. It wasn't in the harsh sunlight, so that's perfect. And I just let the convective breeze once again cool down this. So at this point, I can rehydrate. Uh, still a little bit warm, but it's not, not nearly as hot, of course, as uh, pulling it out of the fire. So this, this shade definitely does help. Uh, once again, there is other methods, digging a hole, actually putting it in the earth, lining it with vegetation. Uh, that'll help speed up the process of cooling through evaporation. So with that, I do appreciate you joining me for this video. Once again, Finding Water in the Desert, part three of this series. I'm Jeff with martinsurvival.com and we'll see you in the next one. Mm. Good stuff.